Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj, we can start, Maharaj. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chatsur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavan Ebyo Vaishnavibyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare so we welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Sri Ishopanishad at the level of Bhakti Shastri. And today we are beginning mantra number 17. Right? We have heard the first three mantras explained how Lord Krishna is the Supreme Proprietor and how everything belongs to Him. And we are expected to only take our quota and not to take more. And when we do that, then we can, we will have a, a, a long life, we can have a long life. But if we don't follow that plan, if we don't follow that arrangement of the Lord, then we will enter into the darkest regions of ignorance. Our life will be very inauspicious. So then, after... The, the first section about the proprietorship of the Lord. The next section, mantras 4 up to mantra 8, described the vision of the Mahabhagavat devotee, the great devotee, how they see all living entities as parts and parcels of the Lord. They see them as being one with the Lord, we gave the phrase ekat vam anupashyataha, right? Oneness in quality, but different in quantity. So the Mahabhagavad devotee, he can see this, he can understand the relationship between the Lord. Is everything okay? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. Every, every... Yes, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. I can continue? Yeah? Yes, yes, Maharaj. I just wanted to give a quick summary of what we've been covering, the structure of the book, Ishopanishad. So, mantras 4 to 8 describe about the vision of the Mahabhagavat devotee and seeing the Supreme Lord and how the living entities are one in quality, but different in quantity. Then the next section was describing the relationship between the Absolute and the Relative. Mantras 9, 10 and 11 described the Absolute and the Relative in terms of knowledge, and then 12, 13 and 14 described the Absolute and the Relative in terms of worship. And we spoke about the danger of cultivating material knowledge without having proper spiritual education, how it can lead to very, a very dangerous situation for the world. And then we spoke about different kinds of worship, how people Sometimes they create their own forms of worship and how there's also a lot, a lot of 
people, they take to the impersonal philosophy and they deny the personal existence of God. They think ultimately God cannot have any form. So we spoke about these different philosophies. We described them as miseducators or people who are they're speaking philosophy, but they're speaking philosophy which is not really authorized, which is not the proper authorized philosophy, which does not come in the disciplic succession. So we spoke about these things, about the impersonalists and the voidists, and we spoke about the Maya Aparita Jnana, the Vedavada Rata, these kind of people, and how they mislead others into dangerous, into darkest, into dark, darkness in ignorance. Right? Then we went on, mantra 15 and 16, we're beginning the prayers to the Lord and asking the Lord to remove the dazzling effulgence. The devotee was desiring to see the personal form of the Lord. So the Ishopanishad was describing how the Lord is personal and He has a form. And the devotee wants to see that form, he wants to realize that form. But to or in order to see that form of the Lord, he has to become pure in devotion. He has to get rid of all of his material desires and attachments. So he has to go through this Brahma Jyoti the impersonal void, he has to go through that impersonal void and come to the oneness, come to the spiritual planets, go through the oneness and come to the spiritual planets, Vaikuntha or Goloka, spiritual planets. So we're going to go on now and we'll hear how the devotee offers prayers to the Lord, desiring to achieve that destination. Are, are there any questions from anyone before we go on? Okay, if there are no questions, then we will continue. Would one of the gentlemen, one of the, our Prabhus like to read the Sanskrit for us? Mantra 17. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Vayuranilam Amrutam Vayuranilam Amrutam Ate Dambasmantam Sariram Ate Dambasmantam Sariram Om Kratos Markutam Smara Om Kratos Markutam Smara Kratos Markutam Smara and translation? Let the temporary bodies be burned to ashes and let the air of life be merged with the totality of air. Now, O oh my Lord, please remember all my sacrifices and because you are the ultimate beneficiary, please remember all that I have done for you. So, have you made a lot of sacrifices, Prabhu? Have you made a lot of sacrifices? Not really, Prabhu Maharaj. No? I've done only all the wrong things only. <laughs> Can, are you going to pray to the Lord like this? What, are you going to please remember all I have done for you? Have you done a lot for the Lord that He, will, that he should remember? Then he can help us. Okay. Okay. Yes, if you've done something good, that will help us. Anyway, you studied this Bhakti Shastri. This is good. Help you. You can remember the Lord. You did this Bhakti Shastri for the pleasure of the Lord, for pleasure of Lord Krishna. You studied the Bhagavad Gita and the scriptures, Ishopanishad. Very nice. Go ahead, read the purport. Hare Krishna. The 
temporary material body is certainly a foreign dress. The Bhagavad Gita 2.2 clearly says that after the destruction of the material body, the living entity is not annihilated, nor does he lose his identity. The identity of the living entity is never impersonal or formless. On the contrary, it is the material dress that is formless and that takes a shape according to the form of the indestructible person. No living entity is originally formless or is wrongly taught by those with a poor fund of knowledge. This mantra verifies the fact that the living entity exists after the annihilation of the material body. Hare Krishna Mata. Yes. So, when Prabhupada went to Russia in 1971, he met Professor Katoshki, one professor there in Moscow, and he was professor of Asian studies. And Prabhupada was speaking to him about, you know, when we leave the body, we take another body. And the professor said to Prabhupada, he said, Oh Swamiji, at the time of death, everything is finished. So materialistic people, they're thinking like that that at the time of death everything is finished. But there are other people who have knowledge of the soul, the self, of the life, the living force in the body. So they understand differently. However, Prabhupada warns about Form, being thinking ourselves to be formless, that we have that the, this they, they think you know we have taken this form now this is illusion but ultimately we're all without form we have no form now they're thinking ultimately we will become one we'll enter into the Brahman. So this is the ignorance of the foolish people, right? Different philosophies are there. Some people are teaching impersonalism or oneness and others are teaching void. So Prabhupada's mission, nirvishesha shunyavadi, right? Goravani pricharine, nirvishesha shunyavadi, paschacha deshata. Preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya to defeat impersonalism and voidism. Voidism, that ultimately everything is nothing. These bogus philosophies. So, Lord Chaitanya's teachings defeat these arguments. We'll go ahead. Someone else, please read. Hare Krishna. Uh, in the material world, material nature displays wonderful workmanship by creating variety of bodies for the living being according to their propensity for sense gratification. The living entity who wants to taste stool is given a material body that is quite suitable for eating stool, that of a hog. Similarly, one who wants to eat the flesh and blood of other animals may be given a tiger's body equipped with suitable teeth and claws. But the human being is not meant for eating flesh, nor does he, has, he have any desire to taste food. Even in the most aboriginal state, human teeth are so made that they can chew and cut fruits and vegetables, although there are two canine teeth so that primitive human can eat flesh if they so it seems like, you know, there's some facility for us to eat meat because Krishna has given us these canine teeth. So the canine teeth are used to t tear the meat and flesh. So it seems like it's okay for us to eat meat. Right? What would you say? What would you say? Uh, no malice. We have uh, enough, Prabhupada mentioned you have enough uh, grains and vegetables where we can 
give nutrition to our body. Well, sometimes just to get some, you know, nice taste. Well, you know, people like the taste of blood, you know. We eat the meat. So? I mean, after all, He gave us the teeth. If we don't eat the meat, then we don't use these two canine teeth. He gave us the canine teeth, we should use them, right? What do you say? I don't know Maharaj. Maharaj, it is only, if it is for primitive men, if they desire only Maharaj, otherwise, actually it is not required for this age. Because we are Anagat Pran and we should have only Anna. We should have only what? Anna, Anna, that is grains and... Uh -huh. Yeah, we have grains, and we have fruit, and we have veg and vegetables, and we can have a bit of meat as well. No, Maharaj, that is uh, your, uh, then as a, of course, a devotee certainly, with the mercy, actually we cannot have that. But when the question of canine comes in, then it is only for the primitive, uh, those, uh, like, you know, human beings for which they want, they, like, you know, they were eating the flesh and all those. Because when they were in the jungle and actually nothing was available, they were eating the food. And so that's the only reason why canine teeth still exist. But for a civilization, never. Yes. But the desire should not be there, Maharaj. My, my opinion is. Once we have given the vows to our Guru, actually then we don't have to have any desire, you know, that we will have the higher taste than we, the lower taste, we will never go to it. Yes, that's true. If one, of course, I mean, like we said before, this is not just the, the business of Guru to get us to give up meat. You know, that should, that should happen even in the very beginning of our Krishna consciousness, that should be there, to give up the meat. Guru is to bring us onto higher consciousness. But if we're still eating meat, then how is it possible? People still eating meat, they cannot get, cannot awaken higher consciousness because they're so, their consciousness is so covered that they have to eat flesh of animals. Yes. Devotees, devotees of Krishna, of course, we eat food which is offered in sacrifice. And we cannot sacrifice the animal like this. We don't, sac we don't do animal sacrifices in the Kali Yuga. Yes. The only sacrifice we do is Sankirtan Yagya, right. That's the real sacrifice, the chanting of the holy names. So, Lord Krishna Himself is a vegetarian and we only offer the pure foods to Krishna and we take what is offered to Krishna. So we have no need for the meat, fish and these. But as you say, some people, they're not so civilized, they're less cultured, they're not devotees, they're not following spiritual practice, so they can take the meat as they have to. You know, they may do it, they may eat when the animal dies, they may wait for the animal to die and then they eat the meat. Okay, that's up to them. But devotees, we don't need, we don't want. Okay, we'll go ahead. Yes, some inquiry there? Yes? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, just a query, uh, for the sake of the argument, if someone quotes in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna says, only Satyam Pushpam Palam Toya. He does not forbid for me to do. When he only speaks about, he accepts Satyam Pushpam Palam Toya. Then why me to forbid? This for the sake of argument, some non-devotee can put this question. 
and also one of the uh, <coughs> reaching to the Prabhupada in Western uh, audiences, he says that if at all you want to eat meat, don't eat uh, beef, you can eat other meat. So how do we understand and how do we repeat, repeat this argument uh, with more sarcastic knowledge? Well, yes, certainly we don't eat the beef. That's the cow is the most sacred animal. That's our mother. So we don't eat the beef. We don't approve that if you, but somebody eats the cow, then they get a heavy reactions. You have to take birth for every hair on the body of the cow and be killed. Right? You want to eat the meat? There's the proper way to eat the meat. You go before the goddess Kali on the full moon night and you tell the goddess, in front of the goddess Kali you can sacrifice a goat, not a cow, but a goat. And you tell the goat that because I want to eat meat, I'm going to kill you, but in the future you can kill me, right? Mamsa, Mamsa, I and you. And so I'm killing you, in the future you can come and kill me. So that's what's happening when people want to eat meat. They, sh they eat meat, they should follow it, they do it the proper way, a religious way. You want sense gratification, you want to eat meat, so you do it like that, in front of Goddess Kali. On the full moon night means once in a month, not every night, once in a month only. On the full moon, full, on the dark moon night it is, the dark, not the full moon, the dark moon night. So dark moon night means once in a month, and that way then you can eat the meat. But, at the, because you're going to be killed in the future. So an intelligent person will think, why should I do like that, if in the future I'm going to be killed? I'm just going to give myself so much misery, so much suffering. So an intelligent person will think like that. So there's there's no saying, there's no scriptural injunction where one can eat the beef or cow. Cow is the most sacred animal. This next to the human being, the soul in the cow will become the human being in the next life. So it's very sinful to kill the cow. And we also tell people that. Devotee will eat food offered in sacrifice. So I said, the goat, you take the goat in front of the goddess Kali, once in the month. And that way you can eat meat for one month. Every month you can come on the dark moon night and sacrifice the goat. But you're going to be killed. So we explain to people the, the reality the facts of the situation. What do you think? It's not accurate. Okay. We'll, we'll go ahead. Maharaj, one, one small query, please. Yes. Same subject. Maharaj, it is uh, said that uh, uh, devotee with the incomplete uh, devotional service if he has some fall down or if he, he get drifted, in the next birth he will be still awarded with the higher birth in a Brahmin, a devotee Brahmin family or Vaishya family. And now person is given that birth like that and that too in India and that too maybe in the Gaudes around Mayapur. And uh, they, his Brahmin is still why they go for the non-vegetarian eating, they are not able to come out of that. They are considered to be the high level devotees in earlier birth like if they are born in that area also. Yes. Because they're Naradama. They're Naradama, they're the lowest. They have the opportunity, they have the good birth, they have the culture, but they don't want to take advantage. So, everyone has independence, everyone has free will. It's up to everybody how they use that independence, how they use their free will. If they want to eat everything, then facility is there. 
They can do it, but next life they'll become a hog. Next life they'll be given the body like the dog or the tiger, so that they can eat the, that, because they desire to eat everything. So next life they'll get the animal body to facilitate that. So these people are so foolish, they don't want to surrender to Krishna. So they get the result. The result is they don't need a human body, they get the animal body. They're put into the lower species of life and they remain there birth after birth. They will take birth again and again. Somehow they were given a good birthday, somehow they got a good chance. They were born in a good family. They were born maybe in the Brahmana family, maybe near the Dham. They had the opportunity. They did not take advantage. They didn't care. So, next life they won't get the opportunity. Next life they'll be put into the lower species of life. So, material world is like that. You go up and down, up and down, like a, a roller, what is it called? Like some roller coaster okay you go up you come up and then you go falling down right so like that Prabhupada told the story punar mustika baba again become a mouse the, you know, the little mouse became by the grace of the yogi became a cat then it became a dog then it became a tiger then it became a mouse again so people are like that they get the good birth and then they go down, and then they come up and get another good, and then go down. They're all staying in the material world, conditioned souls. They have that freedom. Krishna doesn't force. Okay, we'll go ahead in the material world. Prabhu, some Prabhu can be. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. But in any case, the material bodies of all animals and men are foreign. No, no, in the material world. Oh no, okay, you're right, yeah, yeah. And but in any case, right, sorry. But in any case, the material bodies of all animals and men are foreign. Hare Krishna Prabhu. So Prabhupada talks about evolution, right? 
the cycle of evolution, the living entity changes from one body to another. So, did you study evolution when you were at school? Yes, Maharaj. Oh. The Charles Darwin theory is also speaking some, something about this, and Srila Prabhupada also quoting somewhere le something related to Charles Darwin. So, was Darwin right? Yes, Darwin was a theory, right? Yes, Maharaj, that was theory. It was a theory. There was no proof. He was, he was trying to prove it. He was trying to show it, you know, but there was no real proof. They were all, they, they, they talk about things like the missing links. Right? They talk about the missing links. They think if they find the missing links, then this will prove that the evolution, that we evolved from the lower species, right? What is the evolution theory actually? What's the teaching? The teaching that life begins in the water and then uh, gradually it was, it was vegetation, the plants and then worms and then some form of animal without tail like fishes and all. And so where did the human being come from? <laughs> so human being that, that the Charles Darwin evolution theory suggests that first it was without a with tail and gradually it became uh, without tail. So this was the theory postulated uh, it's a long back by Charles Darwin and many people came to believe but, but we give try to give uh, the examples of our uh, Lord, Lord Krishna's avatara right from uh, Varaha uh, and then uh, Narasimha and like that. Yeah, they, uh, so we, we explain that there, there is evolution but it's not that the body is changing. But what's happening? The consciousness is changing. There's evolution of consciousness. So the species are all there, but the, the, the soul is evolving. The consciousness is evolving from lower species to higher species. So it's not that one, spe one species changed into another. They say we came from the ape, right? Darwin's theory said our ancestors were the monkeys. Yes. But, but the monkeys are still here and the people are here. And we don't see any monkeys becoming people. But they, they talk about it, they say like that, but we don't see any, we don't see any evidence of the evolution. So it was just a theory, it was a theory to promote atheism to encourage people to be atheistic because they didn't like that you should believe in God. They didn't like that you should believe in the soul. They wanted people to forget all this. So they promote these atheistic theories. So countries where atheism is very prominent, they will promote this evolution. But we, we preach about evolution of the soul, evolution of the consciousness. From animal consciousness we can become human consciousness. And from the human consciousness then we can go into spiritual consciousness, to the spiritual world. Alright, we will like the Matajis to read. Matajis. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, 
Here in the material world, material nature forces the living entity to change his body due to his different desires or sense gratification. These desires are represented in the various species of life from germs to the most perfected material bodies, those of Brahma and the demigods. All of these living entities have bodies composed of matter in different stages. The intelligent man sees oneness not in the variety of bodies but in the spiritual identity. The spiritual spark which is part and parcel of the Supreme Lord is the same whether he is in a body of a hog or in the body of a demigod. The living entity takes on different bodies according to his pious and vicious activity. The human body is highly developed and has full consciousness. According to the Bhagavad Gita 7.19, the most perfect man surrenders unto the Lord after many many lifetimes of culturing knowledge. The culture of knowledge reaches perfection only when the knower comes to the point of surrendering unto the Supreme Lord Vasudev. Otherwise, even after attaining knowledge of one's spiritual identity, if one does not come to the point of knowing that the living entities are eternal parts and parcel of the whole and can never become the whole, one has to fall down again into the material atmosphere. Indeed, one must fall down even if he has become one with the Brahma Jyoti. Hare Krishna. Okay, so why why does one have to fall down from the Brahma Jyoti? If we've gone if they enter in the Brahma Jyoti, why do they have to come back? Why do they fall down from there? Prabhupada says, indeed one must fall down, even if he has come, has become one with the Brahma Jyoti. So Brahma Jyoti is liberated platform. So why will the man fall down from that position? In uh, Bhagavad Gita 8 chapter it is stated para ab brahman bhana loka Maybe Prabhu there can help you. Yeah, Hare Krishna Hare Maharaj. It is uh, from, in a, from uh, the text given by Krishna, like Abrahma Bona Luka, Punaravarti Nordina, Mam Pitit Pante, Punarjanma Navidyate. So, like, you know, even from the highest uh, material uh, highest material world, that is Brahma Luka, till the, uh, till the Pata Luka, uh, one has to again, after finishing their term, one has to again. Fall down. That is, you know, he has to come back to this material world again. So there is this the circle of birth and death continues even up to Brahma Loka. That is where it is like you know. And in Brahma Jyoti, what will happen is, Maharaj, in Brahma Jyoti, the the, the person who is uh, um, the uh, believer of one who is uh, a believer of voidism or one who is uh, Niraka Nirvisheshwadi. So you know. The person who reaches Brahma Jyoti also, uh, he does not have any activity there to do and uh, ultimately then he falls down. Right, that's the right point because there's no engagement, no activity on the platform of Brahman. And the soul's nature is to be active. The soul needs activity. If there's no activity, then it's, this is not, for some time we like it. For some time you like it, you know, you get a holiday, but if you've no work at all, then oh, very boring, nothing to do. We like engagement, we like activity. And so that's why we come to Krishna consciousness. There's no retirement in Krishna consciousness. Even in old age, we keep working. We see Prabhupada, 80, he's still working, writing and traveling, preaching. So like that. For the soul, there needs to be proper engagement. So on the Brahma Jyoti, they stop all activities. So no, no, no engagement, no, no activity, no relationships. So that's why they fall down, because no, no, no real pleasure there. And we want pleasure, we like pleasure. Just like Krishna, 
Krishna is an Andamaya Bayasat. He, he wants pleasure. We also want pleasure. And if we don't get pleasure in the Brahma Jyoti, then we come back to the material world to find it. Okay. We'll go ahead. Maharaji, another Maharaji can read. Hare Krishna. As we have learned from previous mantra, the Brahma Jyotir, emanating from the transcendental body of the Lord, is full of spiritual sparks that are individual entities with the full sense of existence. Sometimes these living entities want to enjoy their senses and therefore they are placed in the material world to become false lords under the dictation of the senses. Uh, the desire for lordship is the material disease of the living being. For under the spell of sense enjoyment, he, tra he transmigrates through the various bodies manifested in the material world. Becoming one with the Brahma Jyotir does not represent mature knowledge. Only by surrendering unto the Lord completely and developing one's sense of spiritual service does one reach the highest perfectional stage. Okay, so we're hearing about the, the Brahma Jyoti from previous mantras. Brahma Jyoti emanating from the transcendental body is full of spiritual sparks. So there's, there's living entities there in the Brahma Jyoti. And they have their own individual identity, but they're there in the Brahma Jyoti with no engagement, just in that mood of oneness. So then Prabhupada describes, sometimes we want to enjoy the senses. So that's natural. We have senses, we want to use them. Therefore, they're placed in the material world. But we can enjoy, it's, you see, the, the, wit, the, the fallen living entities, they're put in the material world to become lord of the material nature, to try to become the lord. Prabhupada said to become false, false lords under the dictation of the senses. So because they haven't got control over the mind and senses, they become controlled by the senses. The so desire for lording over the material nature, the, the desire for lording is the material disease of the living being. So material disease, you see there's a disease. Under the spell of sense enjoyment, transmigrates through the various bodies, immersed, manifested in the material world. Becoming one with the Brahma Jyoti does not represent mature knowledge. So what is mature knowledge then? If becoming one with the Brahma Jyoti is not mature knowledge, what is mature knowledge? Uh, knowing about the Lord's Bhagavan form, Maharaj. Yes. So what do we have to do? spiritual master and then keep on chanting the Lord's name and uh, when, uh, at the time of the death Antakali Chimam Yevas Marunmukta Galevara then you know we can reach to the abode of Lord Krishna's Goloka. Yeah, if we're able to chant at the time of death, very good. Right? We have to practice, we have to cultivate that kind of consciousness, right? So lording over is the material disease. How is it this in Bhagavad Gita Krishna speaks about this, this this material disease? Right? What is this disease? How, how was it compared? In, in earlier mantras, remember we heard we talked about the fever. The living entity has a fever. Prabhupada gave the example, he said, just like man has got a fever. Yes, yes, Maharaj, temperature. So, uh, 
to control the temperature uh, doesn't mean to completely make the temperature zero. Yes. But you should uh, like uh, the, to get out of this material disease diseases. You should engage uh, under the service of the Lord to please the Lord. Then this is a good. Right. We don't want to increase the fever, right? If we've got a fever, we don't want to increase it more. We want to bring the fever down to the healthy condition. You don't want to make it zero, but you do want to bring it to the healthy condition. Yes. Right? So that's the idea, to come to the healthy condition by the prescribed methods of living and acting in this material world. We have to remember, cultivate both what? We have to cultivate both sides. We spoke of... Both these sides and transcendental knowledge. Uh huh? Both me signs and uh, the culture of knowledge. Marriage. Yes, Nishanth and the culture yeah, of knowledge, right. right. Or Vidya and Avidya. Uh, yeah. We have to cultivate them side by side, right. And that's good. So we want the we have the balanced program to cultivate both by Krishna conscious activities. Right? We don't say Krishna didn't tell Arjuna stop, you don't work, I'll do everything. Krishna told Arjuna fight, but he also told Arjuna, remember me, remember me and fight. And so we have to do duty, we have to work. We can't think, oh don't do anything. Some people think Krishna consciousness means be idle, do nothing. But no, have to be active in the service of Krishna. This is required. So that's the bal balanced program. Okay, we'll go ahead. A Prabhu can read now. Anybody not read? Like to read? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Hare Krishna. Maharaj. Yes. In this mantra, the living entity prays to enter the spiritual kingdom of God after relinquishes his material body and material air. The devotee prays to the Lord to remember his activities and sacrifices. He has performed before his material body is turned into ashes. He makes this prayer at the time of death with the full consciousness of his past deeds and of the ultimate goal. One who is completely under the rule of material nature remembers the heinous activities he performed during the existence of his material body. That consequently uh, he gets another material body after death. The Bhagavad Gita uh, 8.6 confirmed the truth. Yam Yam Rabi Smaran Bhavam Tejandilde Kalevaram Tam Tame Tam Tame Vaidi Kaundeya Sada Sat Bhava Bhavite. Whatever whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body, O oh son, son of Kundi, that state he will attain without fail. Thus the mind carries the living entities' propensities into the next life. Okay, thank you. So, Prabhupada is describing now at the time of death, our mind, our mental condition will determine where we go in the next life. We so, have to remember uh, Krishna when the end of the time. Right. So, we will go to Krishna Lord. So, Prabhupada, the, well, then in this prayer, in this mantra, it describes how the devotee prays to remember my activities and sacrifices. 
Right? Have you done a lot of have you done a lot of sacrifices? Not that much, Maharaj. Because the material body is going to be burned into ashes. Yes, Maharaj. So before we give up the body, we make this kind of prayer at the time of death, right? That our past deeds, we remember our past deeds and we also think about the future, where we want to go. So one who is completely under the rule of material nature, he remembers all the sinful things he did, remembers all the, all the meat and intoxication and the gambling and all everything, all the bad sinful things he performed, it's all there in his mind. And so the result is, what will happen to him? He will go down, maybe in Yamaloka. Uh, yeah, he'll, maybe he'll go to Yamaraj, maybe he'll get, take some other body, maybe an animal body or something. Body. Yeah. So, we, we were hearing the other day about Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva, because this is Damodar month, we're worshipping Lord Damodar. So Nala Kuvera and Mani Griva, you know who they were? Have you heard their names? Yes, Maharaj. Who were they? Kuvera's two sons. Right, Kuvera's two sons, so they were very rich. And they were very handsome, very good looking young men and very but they were very stupid and they were yeah. and they became very drunk and they were having sense gratification. So the result what they became next life? To plant. Yeah, what kind of plant? Yamalarjana. Yeah, Yamalarjuna trees, yeah, big trees. They had to stand for 100 years of the demigods in the body of trees. So they remember how they've been demigods and then they became trees. And similarly, Jadbarat, Jadbarat was just a little careless. Bharat Maharaj, not Jadbarat, but Bharat Maharaj, Bharat Maharaj was in Himalayas. He was up there in Himalayas and he saved, helped to save a young deer. But he became very attached to the deer and the time of death he thought of the deer. So he became a deer in the next life. And so he had to waste two more births. He had to take birth as a deer and then he had to take birth again in a Brahmana family. So, he had two extra births. So, we don't want to take that risk to take an, another birth, take birth again. We want to try to get perfection in this life. Prabhupada wants all of us to become Krishna conscious in this life. Prabhupada would say, don't give me trouble, don't have me come back just to deliver you. <laughs> become Krishna conscious now in this life get perfection. Mm -hmm. So, if we do the proper things regularly here and chant, cultivate remembrance of Krishna, then time of death it will become very easy. So, spiritual world. Yes? What did you say Prabhu? He will go to a spiritual world. Yes, right. He can go to spiritual world. If he cultivates properly, if he does everything the right way, you know, he regular, every day you have to chant, you have to take prasadam, you have to, you know, worship Krishna, offer obeisances to Krishna like that, then naturally at the end of life, Krishna will remember us. It is stated in the Puran, as it said, what happens if a devotee cannot remember Krishna at the time of death? 
and the answer is given, he said, if the devotee cannot remember Krishna, Krishna will remember him. Hmm? But don't take that risk. Don't take that risk, you know. Somebody may say, oh good, Krishna will remember me, I don't need to worry. <laughs> no, we, we don't know what kind of devotee we are. We don't know what condition we're going to be in when we leave the body. We don't know. So it's not always so easy that we can remember Krishna. But in special situations, Krishna can remember the devotee and deliver him. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone else read? Yes, Maharaj. Nandarana Maharaj. Hare, Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Unlike the simple animals who have no developed mind, the dying human being can remember the activities of his life like dreams at night. Therefore, his mind remains surcharged with material distress. And consequently, he cannot enter into spiritual kingdom of the spiritual body. The devotees, however, develop a sense of love for Godhead by practicing devotional service to the Lord. Even if at the time of death, a devotee does not remember his service to the Lord, the Lord does not forget him. This prayer is this prayer gives the remind to the Lord of the devotee sacrifices, but even if there is no such reminder, the Lord does not forget the service rendered by his pure devotee. Jai. So this is Krishna's kindness. <laughs> but don't take the risk. Don't give Krishna extra work. If we can remember Krishna ourselves, that's the best. Right? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes. Hello, Pranam, if you divine with us, kid. In this, can I share one of the from Paramahapura? Um, Krishna said another spoke out like that, I remember. Okay. Uh, Krishna said in Paramahapura, Yadi Vajati Nada Ushena Nada Bhakta Mamana Chasmare Aham Smarami Mad Bhakta. Translation is, if my devotee is unable to remember me at the time of death because of disturbance felt uh, within the body at that time, then I shall remember my devotee and take him back to my supreme awards. Uh, this is means uh, my own way of winning of translation. Yadi vadati. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's Vara what is it? Varaha Purana? Yeah, it's Varaha Purana. Yadi Vadatina Doshana. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada is paraphrasing that there in his purport here. Same thing. We, we know in Bhagavad Gita also Krishna says, Kunti apriti janahi nam me bhakta pranashati. My devotee will never perish. So a devotee surrendered to Krishna, it depends on Krishna. It doesn't depend on his own efforts, it depends on Krishna, it's in Krishna's hands. We surrender to Krishna. We'll go ahead, Manaji can read, please. Who hasn't read? Someone from the ladies who didn't read Hare yet? Krishna, Hare. Yes, Hare Krishna. The Lord clearly describes his intimate relationship his devotees in the Bhagavad Gita 9.3034. Even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. He quickly becomes righteous and attains lasting peace. O son of Kunti, declare it boldly that my devotee never perishes. O son of Krita, those who take shelter in me, though they be of low birth, 
women, Vaishyas, as well as Shudras, can attain the supreme destination. How much more this is so of the righteous Brahmanas, the devotees and the saintly kings. Therefore, having come to this temporary miserable world, engage in loving service unto me. Engage your mind always in thinking of me, become my devotee, offer obeisances to me and worship me. Being completely absorbed in me, surely you will come to me. Okay, so Prabhupada is quoting from Bhagavad Gita here, ninth chapter. Very important statements. How Krishna promises to deliver his devotee. Devotees surrender to Krishna and Krishna delivers them. Krishna delivers us from this material world. So it mentions that somebody may be uh, it, some, see, even if one commits the most abominable action, if he is engaged in devotional service, that means somehow by he somehow he has some habit which he's not able to immediately give up. But he he hates himself for it. But somehow he's doing these things. He's got this bad habit, this bad habit. And so he feels very bad. But still he doesn't want to give up devotional service. But at the same time he's very entangled with the bad habit. And he can't give up his bad habit. So Krishna makes arrangements to help this devotee, to get free of his attachment. Srila Prabhupada was in uh, Jakarta and there was one man there, he said, he said to Prabhupada, he said, Swamiji, I love Krishna very much. But I love wine also. So Prabhupada told him, he said, when you drink the wine, you should think, this is the taste of Krishna. Rasoham apsu kontiya. Krishna said, I am the taste in water, the taste in liquid. So he said, when you drink it, you simply think of Krishna. This will help you gradually to give up. So, like that, people have bad habits. But Krishna is very kind. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur will explain. Who would like to read more? Prabhu can read. Hare Krishna. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakura explains these verses in this way. One should regard a devotee of Krishna to be on the right path of the saints, even though such a devotee may seem to be Sudhira, Sudhira, Durachara, a person of loose character. One should try to understand the real purport of the word Sudhurachara. A conditioned soul has to act for double functions, namely for the maintenance of the body and again for self-realization, social status, mental development, cleanliness, austerity, nourishment, and the struggle for existence are all for the maintenance of the body. The self-realization part of one's activity is executed in one's occupation as a devotee of the Lord, and one performs action in that connection also. One must perform these two different functions along parallel lines because a conditioned soul cannot give up the maintenance of his body. The proportion of the activities for maintenance of the body decreases, however, in proportion to the increase in the devotional service. As long as the proportion of the devotional service does not come to the right point, there is a chance for an occasional exhibition of worldliness. But it should be noted that such worldliness cannot continue for long because by the grace of Lord, such imperfections will come to an end very shortly. Therefore, the path of devotional service is the only right path. If one is on the right path, even an occasional occurrence of worldliness does not hamper one in the advancement of self-realization. Oh, so very important description information given here. Prabhupada's quoting Bhaktivinoda Thakur about this balance, right? Self-realization and also our duties in material life, maintenance of the body, right? So 
what should be the arrangement, how should we balance them? Even when we just perform our material duties in order to make sure that uh, we can sustain the life and we can maintain our um, uh, prescribed duties, uh, but we should parallelly continue the devotional service and uh, after a certain stage probably Lord himself will um, guide us to uh, raise the level of uh, devotional service and uh, diminish the level of uh, material attachments and uh, other prescribed duty will gradually and responsibility will gradually get reduced in life of Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, right. The, in the beginning, you know, we need both. We need, we need to uh, devote a good amount of time to maintain our material life. But we also need to give some time for our spiritual practice. Right? We give the example, the train goes on two tracks, in India anyway, two tracks, right? If the tracks are not level, turn over. So you want to keep the tracks level, means don't neglect your material life. And at the same time, don't neglect your spiritual life. You have to have a balance, proper balance. And, but then gradually, as we get, particularly, you know, we get older, you get retired, then you can come back to India, maybe you come and stay in the Holy Dham, Mayapur or Vrindavan, you give up the material job, then you can go fully into devotional service, right? Because we're older, we're ready to give up the material duties, you're not going to have more children, you're settled in family life, and you can devote yourself more fully to spiritual practice. Because we have to prepare for the next life, right? But Prabhupada explains, or Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains, that it's an, until we take up the devotional service more fully, there will always, there can be the tendency, a chance to some, some exhibition of worldliness. What is that? Could you give an example, Prabhu? What would... Prabhu? Yes? Bhaktivinoda Thakur, Mahasaya, one song at this very prominent, I should I lyrics it, try to sing? Well, just tell us what he say, what he says, just tell us the translation. Translation is, uh, I have given, I have surrendered everything my life to at your lotus feet. You have given this family as your servant, I am earning and I am taking care of them so they can do your devotional service. Okay. And Bhaktivinoda Dhrakul Mahasaya also says in that version that uh, uh, I am like a, I am like a dog who has to take care of always the master. And so similarly, I am your servant and my duty only to surrender myself or give everything to at your lotus feet. Okay. Nothing belongs to me. On your behalf, I am doing only my duty. Mm -hmm. All right, but I, I want to hear what is this meaning? You know, he talks about worldliness. If somebody exhibits some worldliness, would you tell me? Let 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 somebody else answer. Uh, you know the person who was reading. Let him tr um, try. Hare, Hare Maharaj. Yes. Um, th this the worldliness uh, is a, a shift of gear onto mundane uh, uh, other activities uh, without having any uh, devotional service performed and uh, slowly slipping our. Um, path into the, the single track of um, uh, in, uh, making our life in balance on the fully uh, material activities. So we, may, we may end up doing a lot of um, abominable activities. So oh. there are charo. Yeah, Sudhara yeah. Uh, what are these abominable activities? Uh, what, what kind of abominable activities? following those uh, spiritual principles of uh, regulatory principles, um, things like that? Yes, we may become, you know, world, worldliness means we get very absorbed in our material body. 
and maybe you, you, you spend the whole night just watching movies, television, and, or, you know, some cricket match or something. You know, we get very absorbed in these kind of mundane things which have nothing to do with Krishna consciousness very far away. So this is worldliness. It could be also politics. You know, when some, you know, like uh, th that uh, Jai Lalita, when she was the governor there in Tamil Nadu, when she died, you know, it was a big thing, you know, and one man I know who was very devoted, you know, he got, wow, it became, a, he was, you know, he got so absorbed in the news, it became such a big thing, you know, everybody to hear the whole thing, what happened and all the different people involved and everything. You know, I totally forgot about Krishna, you know, became, you know, we get, these kind of things happen, you know, worldliness, we get very absorbed in the material world, you know, we're thinking about COVID-19 as well, you know, this is also a big issue. and people are really into it and what is the figures today and how many more people have got it now and how many countries have, and what is the, the figures and how many are dying and how many are recovering and we get very absorbed in all these things and so we forget about Krishna consciousness so this is worldliness forgetfulness of Krishna as you said you know, we, and there are so many ways to forget Krishna. <laughs> so we have to always be careful, try to bring the mind back. Wherever the mind wanders, bring it back to Krishna. All right? So Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, uh, that worldliness will soon go by the grace of the Lord. Imperfections will come to an end very shortly. So this is the power of devotional service. So long as we keep up our devotional service, then these imperfections will soon be removed. All right, we'll go ahead. Maharaji can read now. Facilities. Krishna Maharaj, all the facilities suggested in this mantra can be easily obtained by constant contact with the personal teacher of the Absolute Truth. Devotional service to the Lord consists essentially of nine transcendental activities. Oh, that paragraph, sorry. The facilities of devotional service are denied the impersonalist because they are attached to the Brahma Jyoti feature of the Lord. As suggested in the previous mantras, they cannot pretend, penetrate the Brahma Jyoti because they do not believe in the personality of Godhead. Their business is mostly word jugglery and mental speculation. Consequently, the impersonalists pursue the fruitless labor as confirmed in the 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, 12.5. Okay, so the impersonalists, they don't get to go into the spiritual planets, right? They can go to the Brahma Jyoti. Yes, Maharaj. Right? But why, why can't they go to Krishna Loka? Why can't they come to see Krishna? Because they don't believe the personal form of the Lord. Right. Yeah, because they're not devotees, right? They have no devotion. <laughs> they have no devotion, so they have no interest even to see Krishna. They simply want the oneness. They want the light. They just go into the light, you know. Like they're thinking this is enjoyment, to go into that great light, that oneness of the light. So this is confirmed in 12th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, 12.5. Who knows the verse? Impersonalists pursue a fruitless labor. Loka verse 5. Klesho dvikasta ras devsham avyakta sarta chetasam avyakta higatir dukham deha vidgakra papyate 
translation of the shloka is for those whose mind are attached to the unmanifested impersonal feature of the supreme advancement is very troublesome to make progress in that discipl discipline is always difficult for those who are embodied mm -hmm. yes they advance, they, they make progress very slowly with great difficulty because they're meditating on being unembodied. But, but we are embodied, we have a body, but they're meditating on being one or giving up the individuality. So they're meditating on something beyond their experience. So klesha, just trouble, so many troubles they get in the path of realization. And ultimately, they go, if they get liberation to Brahma Jyoti, they, go, they can't stay there, they come back again. They can't remain. Okay, we'll go ahead. Prabhu can read. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. All the facilities suggested in this mantra can be easily obtained by constant contact with the personal feature of the Absolute Truth. Devotional service to the Lord consists essentially of nine transcendental activities. This one, first is hearing about the Lord, second is glorifying the Lord, third is remembering the Lord, fourth is serving the lotus feet of the Lord, fifth is worshipping the Lord, sixth is offering prayers to the Lord, seventh is serving the Lord, Eight, enjoying friendly association with the Lord and nine, surrendering everything unto the Lord. These nine principles of devotional service taken all together or one by one help a devot devotee remain constantly in touch with the God. In this way, at the end of the end of life, it is easy for the devotee to remember the Lord. By adopting only one of these nine principles, the following renowned devotees of the Lord were able to achieve the highest perfection. By hearing of the Lord, Maharaja Parishit, the hero of the Srimad Bhagavatam, attains the desired result. Second, just by glorifying the Lord, Sukadeva Goswami, the speaker of the Srimad Bhagavatam, attained his perfection. Number three, by praying to the, praying to the Lord, Akrura attained the desired result. Number four, by remembering the Lord, Prahlad Maharaj attains the, the result. Number five, by worshipping the Lord, Prithu Maharaj attains perfection. Number six, by serving the lotus feet of the Lord, the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, attains perfection. Seven, by rendering personal service to the Lord, Anuman attains the desired result. Number eight, through his friendship with the Lord, Arjuna attains the desired result. Number nine, by surrendering everything he had to the Lord, Maharaja Bali attained the desired result. Hare Krishna. Okay, so nine processes of devotional service. Prabhupada said, we can do one or we can do all. Right? Who did, who did all of them? Ambarish Maharaj. Right, Ambarish Maharaj. So, if somebody says, well, I want to be the friend of the Lord, is that okay? Yeah, that does so okay, I think. But it should be like a perfect uh, in the one in the one activities. Yeah. We have to begin by hearing and chanting. First of all hearing. And then we hear nicely, then we can repeat chanting. And when we do hearing and chanting, then remembrance will come. But if we try to surrender everything, that's very difficult. Who can do that? It's not easy to do at all, to surrender everything. We're not ready for that. You have to be on the level of Raga Bhakti. You have to be very advanced to surrender everything. And similarly also to become Krishna's friend. That's not so easy. You have to be very pure. You have to also be like Raga Bhakti. Just like the cowherd boys. 
What was the qualification of the cowherd boys to be Krishna's friends? They, they, they simply think that Krishna is the friend. Yeah, but what was their qualification to take birth as friends of Krishna? They'd done pious activities over many lifetimes. Krita punya punja. Right? It was stated there in the verse that they performed pious activities over many lifetimes. And so that's where they were able to be with Krishna as his friend. And similarly, Arjuna. Arjuna is not an ordinary person. You know, he's with Krishna. Krishna is speaking Bhagavad Gita to him because he's, he's a devotee and he's Krishna's friend. So these two processes are more difficult, becoming the friend and surrendering everything. But hearing and chanting, they're the root of the creeper of the... they're very important. And we're encouraged to really nourish these two, to take part as much as we can in these two activities. And gradually the other processes come. As we hear more, then we know how to offer prayers and we can recite the prayers. We learn how to worship the Lord. Serving the lotus feet of the Lord, that, is, that can be different things. That can be things like worshipping Tosi and also serve, going to the Holy Dham and doing Parikrama in the Holy Dham, taking part in the Parikrama. This is all serving the lotus feet of the Lord and serving the, the pure devotees of the Lord because they have taken shelter at the feet of the Lord. So if you serve the pure devotees, it's like serving the lotus feet of the Lord. And becoming a servant. Well, Hanuman, he's a personal servant of the Lord. But we can become a servant, maybe not, per not so personal, but at a distance. All of us, we do service. Devotional service is very important. It is said, if we don't have a taste for hearing, then we do more service. And by doing service, we get blessing, we get purification, we become more qualified to hear. So it's good for us to do service as much as we can. Okay, we'll go ahead. Who would like to read? Hare Krishna. Actually, the explanation of this mantra and of practically all the mantras of the Vedic Hymen is summarized in the Vedanta Sutra and properly explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the mature fruit of the Vedic tree of Siddha. In Srimad Bhagavatam, this particular mantra is explained in the questions and answers between Maharaja Parikshit and Sukadeva Goswami at the very beginning of their meeting. Hearing and chanting of the signs of God is the basic principle of devotional life. The complete Bhagavatam was heard by Maharaja Parikshit and chanted by Sukadeva Goswami. Maharaja, Maharaja Parikshit inquired from Sukadeva, Sukadeva because Sukadeva was a greater spiritual master than any great yogi or transcendentalist of his time. Maharaja Parikshit's main question was, what is the duty of every man, specifically at the time of death? And Sukadeva Goswami answered, Tasmat Bharata Sarvatma Bhagavan Ishwaro Hetti Shrodo Vyaha Kirti Tavyascha Smarta Vyascha Chata Everyone who desires to be free from all anxieties should always hear about, glorify and remember the personality of Godhead, who is the supreme director of everything, the extinguisher of all difficulties and the super soul of all living entities. Bhagavadam 2.1.5 Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so the explanation of this mantra and all the mantras is summarized in Vedanta Sutra and explained in Srimad Bhagavatam. 
So, you can see all the scriptures are related. The Vedanta Sutra, the Srimad Bhagavatam, and here the Ishopanishad. They're all teaching. Prabhupada said these mantras are explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Srimad Bhagavatam is the commentary of the Vedanta Sutra. So then Prabhupada talks about how the Srimad Bhagavatam is about questions and answers. Bhagavad Gita also, we've got Krishna and Arjuna. Arjuna is asking the questions and Krishna is answering. And you see sometimes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, you've got Lord Chaitanya asking questions to Ramananda Rai. And so the scriptures are generally like that, questions and answers, hearing and chanting. So uh, it's very good to spend our time in this way discussing the scriptures. So Prabhupada explains the importance of hearing. And then he quotes his, one of Maharaj Pariksit's questions, because Maharaj Pariksit's going to die. So he said, what is my duty about, I'm about to die? And what is the duty of every man? Because we don't know when we're going to have to die. So it's the same for everyone. And the verse is given, very nice verse. Tasmat Bharata Sarvatma. Bhagavan Ishvaro Hari, right? the duty of everyone to be free from all anxieties. Because we're all anxious, especially at the time of death, we're going to be very anxious. But if we hear and glorify and remember Krishna, then all the anxieties can be overcome. Krishna is the director of everything. So he can free us from all the anxiety. Certainly, material world, so much anxiety is there. But if we hear about Krishna, then we can overcome all these difficulties. Okay? Someone else like to read? Hare Krishna. Please. So called human society is generally engaged at night in sleeping. Everyone who has desired to be free from all anxieties should always hear about, glorify, and remember the personality of Godhead, who is the supreme director of everything, the extinguisher of all difficulties, and the supreme and super soul of all living entities. So called human society is generally engaged at night in sleeping and having sex and during the daytime in earning as much as possible or else in shopping for family maintenance. People have very little time to talk about personality of Godhead or to inquire about him. They have, they have dismissed God's existence in so many ways, preliminary by declaring him to be impersonal, that is without sense perceptions. But in the basic literature, whether the Upanishads, Vedanta Sutra, Bhagavad Gita, or Srimad Bhagavatam, it is de declared that Lord is a Lord is a sentient being, a being and a supreme overall, supreme overall other living entities. His glorious activities are identical with himself. One should therefore not indulge in hearing and speaking of the rubbish activities of worldly politicians and so-called big, big man in society, but should mold his life in such a way that he can engage in bodily activities without wasting a second. See, Shukunishan directs us, directs us towards such bodily activities. Okay, right. Finish the okay go ahead. Very well. Unless one is accustomed to devotional practice, what will he remember in the time of death, when the body is dislocated, and how can he pray to the Almighty Lord to remember his sacrifices? Sacrifice means denying the interest of the sense. One has to learn his heart by employing the sense to the service of the Lord during one's lifetime. One can utilize the result of such practice at that time of 
Okay. So it was stated there, Om Kratos Mara Kratam Smara, Kratos Mara Kratam Smara. Right? Well, the, the devotee is praying, please remember all my sacrifices, and because you are ultimate beneficiary, please remember all that I have done for you. So this human life is an opportunity for us. Of course, Krishna doesn't need our service. It's not that we have to, we can really do anything for him, but we have an opportunity to try to use, do something worthwhile with this body. Krishna doesn't need us, but he's giving us a chance in the form of this Krishna consciousness movement, that we can all take up this Krishna consciousness movement, chanting Hare Krishna and reading the books, learning about Krishna and appreciating Krishna, worshipping Krishna in the home, offering the foods to him like that. It's a big change and it such, makes such a difference at the time of death. If we, when the devotee leaves the body, devotee is not in difficulty. Devotee, because devotee knows what's happening. He knows he's used his life in the service of Krishna. So when he gives up the body, he knows he's going on to serve Krishna some other place. We serve Krishna here, next life we go on and serve Krishna some other place. So it's not a problem for a devotee to leave the body. But one who is not a devotee, who hasn't done anything, he hasn't used their life, then they have a big problem, then they're very afraid, they're very fearful. But if we make proper use of this life, we have nothing to fear. Krishna is there. Just like Dhruva Maharaj, Dhruva Maharaj was there and he was at Badarik Ashram and the Vishnu Dudas came. At that time, he just stood on the head of death personified. So when death comes before us, we just stand on the head of death personified. And get in the aeroplane, the Vaikuntha aeroplane and go off. We don't have to worry, we just take shelter of Krishna. All right, any question? Anybody? Yes, Maharaji. Yes. So I just want to know what are those pious activities actually mean? Well, pious activity, just like in Bhagavad Gita, it says also, Yesham Tvantagatam Papam Jananam Punya Karmanam, that to take up devotional service, we have to have acted piously. So, what are these pious activities? These pious activities, they're different levels of piety, you see. There's pious activities on the material platform, there's pious activities on the level of Brahman, and there's pious activities in relation to devotees. So these pious activities are Bhakti Unmuli Sukriti. When we perform pious activities in relation to a devotee, that gives us the, us the greatest benefit. We get the greatest benefit when we are able to perform some activities in the service of devotees. Uh, okay, okay, Manish, thank you so much. All right, we want to... Uh, Maharaj, Maharaj, here I have... Can I have uh, uh, request you something to further to enlighten me? Uh -huh. Very good, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, there is a difference between pious activities, uh, sorry, Purna Karma, uh, pious activities and spiritual activities. Pious activities also can be nullified in the way of doing some philanthropical job. That is also pious activities. Because pious activities doesn't take or doesn't engage us with Krishna, which is a spiritual activity, does it? But in this context, when you explain the pious activities, what you said, because of previous pious activities, they become Gopas, a friend of Krishna. How that is, these pious activities get differentiated from just now what we, uh, just one other way pious activities definition you 
Yes, well, I mentioned that it has to be devotion, you have that, their pious activity, their piety has to all be in relation to devotees and devotional service. Then that is actual bhakti and muli sukriti. And that qualifies one. To actually become one of the friends of Krishna, you can understand that they have to have been, you know, they have to be very pure souls. They have to be very, very advanced devotees. And they have to be been very, very pious. They did a lot of service. Now, it's just like gopis, there are many different levels of gopis. And so you don't get immediately to become one of the intimate associates of Krishna. But you serve from a distance. Just like maybe you get a job in the palace to serve the king. You don't get immediately to go and serve the king. The people serving the king are the most experienced, the most loyal, the most trusted servants. So the people who are most intimate with, with Krishna or with the gopis, they're the most intimate, the most experienced ones. And other ones, they're newer, they're in a the distance, they're learning from a distance. Under, they work under other gopis, they're, you know, the gopis, they're all in groups. And you have group leaders, just like our Bhakti Brikshas, you know, you have a group leader and, you know, and the group leader helps us and uh, there's people over the group leaders. So similarly like that with the gopis and with the cowherd boys, not that you immediately get to go very close and be with Krishna. You have to gradually, gradually qualify for that intimate relationship. And the qualification is devotional service. The more you're able to do devotional service, the more you're able to give pleasure to Krishna by our service, then the more we become qualified. Hmm? Is it recommended to, uh, in Gorakhvindana, be with Krishna serving or in this material world, serve Guru and Krishna and devotees? No difference. You serve Guru and Krishna in this world, it's no different from serving Krishna in the spiritual world. Yeah, because it, actually it said the one who is the servant of Krishna's devotees, he's the most fortunate because he's getting the greatest mercy. To be the servant of the devotee is the greatest fortune. Just Krishna says, uh, you know, worship of Vishnu is the greatest, but even greater than the worship of Vishnu is those things in relation to Vishnu. So when we become the servant of Krishna's devotees, then that wins us a lot and we get a lot of merit, we get a lot of special sukriti, a lot of punya, and really helps us to make great spiritual advancement. But it's not very easy to become the servant of a devotee, because devotees, they don't like to take service. They won't allow you. They say, no, 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 no. Very difficult. <laughs> so, okay, we have to stop here. We will meet this evening. What time are we meeting? Four o'clock. Six thirty Indian time. Okay. Six thirty. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki jai.